Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Joanna Albala, and I'd like to welcome you to Science on Saturday. Today is the last in our series on Marvelous Machines, and I'm joined at the podium today by our presenters, Catherine Lewis, who got her uh, Bachelor of Science degree from University of San Francisco in mathematics, <laughs> and Roger Johnson, who got his Bachelor uh, of Arts degree in English from uh, CSU East Bay. So we have some locally educated presenters. Um, Roger is a teacher at San Ramon uh, High School, at uh, Monta Vista High School, and uh, Catherine works in our computations division at the lab. So without further ado, let's get started. Thanks, Joanna. So today we're going to be talking about the evolution of computing technologies. So at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, we started in 1952. At that point in time, computational science was already part of our portfolio. So this is a big thing that we've been invested in our entire time. Um, if you look on the picture on the left, that is one, an example of one of the first computers, a UNIVAC. And the picture on the right is an example of our newest supercomputer. It's actually called Sierra. So the computer on the left, um, if we started in 1952, that was uh, almost 30 years before people had computers, started to get computers in their houses, and about 50 years before the first smartphone came out. So this has been part of our culture for a long time, and it's really important to the work we do. So you might be asking yourself, but what is a supercomputer? Well, we'll talk about this a, a lot today, and you'll see it in this first video. But one thing I want to emphasize is that supercomputers started with um, what we consider what we call serial processing. And so that means that it went one thing at a time. And now they've evolved, and we do a lot of parallel computing. And so that means that things can be done at the same time, and that can make computers go a lot faster, and we, we can solve our problems a lot faster because of that. Now we'll watch this short video on supercomputers. This is a supercomputer. And no, it's not just a PC with a cape and good intentions. Yes, it's an extremely powerful computer. But wait, what's a computer? A computer is a machine that takes in information, stores and processes it, and generates an output. Supercomputers do the same thing, but faster, with more data, and in a different way. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Personal computers from the 80s and 90s were serial processors. They performed operations one thing at a time, like checking things off a to-do list in an orderly fashion. PCs we have today, and even our smartphones, have made a lot of progress and can now perform multiple operations at a time. But for problems that are extremely complex, like simulating molecular behavior or modeling the Earth's climate, serial processing or even using a modern PC would take way too long. Supercomputers solve this problem by being able to perform many operations at once, in parallel. These kinds of computers have more processors and split problems into chunks, with each processor working on a different piece and all the processors working together at the same time. Want to hear a number that'll blow your mind? When you ask a supercomputer to work on a problem, it can be like asking a hundred million PCs to work on the problem. Now that is power. You can imagine that the kind of software that helps you tell your laptop what to do probably won't work when you're talking to a supercomputer. Supercomputing systems require scaled up software that organizes, assigns, stores, and processes data in the particular way that makes parallel computing possible. And some problems are easier to solve with parallel computing than others. Fun fact, problems that are really easy to split into chunks across a parallel computing network are called embarrassingly parallel problems. Something else to consider, running an immense number of processors requires an immense amount of power, both to run the computers and to cool them down. Just like your laptop has a fan in it to keep all its moving and electrical parts cool so it can continue to function optimally, computers on a much larger scale have to be kept cool too either by fan or by cooled water that flows through pipes throughout the computing building. So, supercomputers not only solve some of the world's toughest problems, but also present interesting software and hardware challenges for the world's most creative problem solvers. The new supercomputer being installed at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, called Sierra, will be one of the fastest in the world, and will be used to solve a diverse array of complex problems, like how to speed up discovery of new cancer drugs, 
and will help us ask questions the world needs answers to. So you saw some examples of what supercomputers can be used for, but let's talk about some things that you have probably experienced. Airplanes. So airplanes have come a long way since the Wright brothers first had their famous flight at Kitty Hawk in 1903. Um, and a lot of that development was before there were supercomputers. And so they used experiments. Today we can use experiments and computer models together to really understand how to make airplanes better and faster and work well. So we do this by integrating experiments and computer models. So experiments, you probably all experienced this when you um, participated in science fair projects or had done science experiments at school. And what you are doing is you're trying to measure data. And so we call that your observables, um, things that you can see and measure. And so this is sometimes really hard. You can only measure it in certain ways. And sometimes that, pr that creates challenges. So for example, if your thermometer only, only works to whole degrees, or your ruler is in inches, and you need to measure something that's a lot smaller than that, or you don't know necessarily exactly how long it took you to hit the stop on a timer. So there are errors that are introduced into that. Computer models, on the other hand, are very different. You can get measurements all over in a computer model, but it has some things that make it challenging, too. First of all, you need to have equations. And so we're showing an equation here, force equals mass times acceleration, and that's Newton's second law. And so for a computer model, you can say, um, your input could be your mass, and since you know acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, you could calculate the force. So you could put in a mass, get the force, and then you could put in a different mass and see how it changes things. So you're putting in input and output, and you're getting output. But a complication is that you actually have to understand the equations that are used to solve that problem. Another complication is that it's an approximation. And so you can't, you can't know everything everywhere. And it doesn't work exactly like the real world. It's an approximation. And so there are errors that are introduced that way. So here's an example of an experiment. Um, and this is with aerodynamics, because we, we were talking about the airplanes. And so this is using what's called an airfoil. And there's smoke that goes around it so that we could see how the air moves around the airfoil. The airfoil represents a wing, so we can understand how the wing uh, is affected and how the air is affected by the airfoil. So what you see is as it's going straight, the, the wind is going around it in, in a normal way. And then as it turns, the air, the um, faster air mixes with the slower air and, and causes some turbulence there. So this is a really good way to get information. Here's another example of a 3D computer model that is doing something very similar. Um, and you can get an idea of how, how computer models allow you to look at a lot more information. So we're going to go to YouTube to look at this one. And this is a 3D computer model of the same thing. In this example, the red represents a higher Mach number and the blue represents a lower Mach number. Now that's a measure of speed. And so the red is going really fast and the, and the blue is not going as fast. And you can see how it's mixing, how the, the two different speeds are mixing together. What you can do here is you get a lot of information at a lot of different points. But you had to understand the equations that went into solving this problem. So at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, one of our big examples for this is the National Ignition Facility that we call NIF. So we are, NIF is used to help us understand energy and our universe. Um, it creates conditions that are similar to the sun. So what happens is we have this whole realm, which is this uh, pencil eraser sized uh, cylinder, which is made out of gold that you see on the top left. Uh, that that um, has holes in it which allow 192 laser beams to come into it. There's a capsule that's about the size of a BB inside of it that implodes and explodes, 
and it is creating conditions like the sun, where it's getting up to 100 million degrees Celsius, and it has pressures of up to 100 billion times the Earth's atmosphere. So it's very, it, it's very complex, um, and this is, this is way past you know, F equals MA that we talked about before. There are lots of complex physics equations that you're using to solve this. We use both the experiments and computer models together to understand what's happening here. And one thing to remember is that the experiments help us understand how to make our computer models better, and the computer models help us to understand how to drive our experiments. So we need really big supercomputers to model this. And they keep getting bigger. So why? Why are they getting bigger? One of the big reasons is what we call resolution. To, um, to explain this, think about uh, an image that you have in 2D. And if you only had a, a small number of pixels that represent that image, it's pretty hard to tell what that image is but you could increase the resolution. You could increase the number of pixels that you have on that, and over time, you can see that the image is a butterfly. Now, for our computer models, we don't just have a 2D image. We have something that is 3D often, and it changes over time. So remember how we saw the video of the 3D airfoil that was changing over time with the, with the speed around it um, changing over time. Now, that is a lot, there's a lot more to that. And so if you're looking at the 2D image, you can say that as you scale up the resolution, that's x squared, which gets big fast. But if you're thinking about a 3D model and you're adding time to it, then it's more like x to the fourth, which gets big a lot faster. And it really does matter. Resolution is very important. Um, so this, this video will show you um, the effects that resolution has. So if you look at the image here, on the, right, on the left side, um, that's our reference resolution. And so that's our lowest resolution. And then the resolution increases as you go clockwise around it. With the highest resolution, 12 times the resolution at the bottom. And so what you'll see when we play this video is that, um, that the blue, which represents the colder temperature, material and the red, which represents the, uh, the higher temperature material, that those materials start to mix. And you'll see that not only is the image a lot clearer in the bottom with the higher resolution, but it also changes the results. It changes the time. And so you can see that they are going at different times, and that's because you're actually not solving the problem as accurately in the lower resolution as you are in the higher resolution. And so it's not just about making a clearer image and being able to see more details. It's also about solving the problem cor correctly. And it makes a big difference. If you look at this, you can clearly see that on the left side, it, it, it is not as high, as, as precise as it is on the bottom. So from all of this, you see that computers have evolved significantly since 1952 when the lab started. Our newest supercomputer can, uh, can process, it runs at 125 petaflops. And so what that means is it's 125 with 15 zeros after it operations every second. So this is a huge number, and it's really hard to even think about how huge this number is. So, if you take that many seconds and you calculate how many years you get out of that, it's almost four billion years. And so that's almost as old as the Earth itself. So this number that you just see up on the screen may not seem you know, as big as it is, but it's enormous. And so we understand that computers are getting bigger and faster, but are they getting smarter? And a big question here is what is your definition of smart? So your cell phones are a computer. And I'm going to tell you that your cell phone is learning. It may not be getting smarter, necessarily, but one measure is that it's learning, and it is learning. And to help us, uh, help us understand that, Roger's going to come out and help us uh, see how our, our cell phones are learning. Hey. 
So Katie and I sent some text messages back and forth, and we're going to see the result of that up on the screen here. So are you going to start us off? Yeah. So I'm just going to send him a simple, normal text message that says, how are you doing? So I got that message, but then instead of responding normally, what I did was always pick the middle suggested word on the screen. So for me, I said, okay, I'll send them a picture. And then I sent that off to her. And so I'm trying to figure out why he sent me this. I didn't say anything about pictures, and so I say, a picture of what? And again, those, those words that are generated below are picked based on my usage of my phone and also the usage of everybody else who's using this same system. So it's not really going to make a lot of sense, but I look down and it says, thanks, and so I pick thanks. And then two, all of you guys, and it keeps going like this, that you are interested and we are still going out. So this doesn't make much sense to me. And so I'm saying, where are we going? I'm confused. And so I keep going with this and I say, we can get the tickets to you, get them off the phone with us at noon. Again, randomly, based on my usage, based on the usage of all of you. My phone is learning as we go along. And how does she deal with this? So I just say, this conversation doesn't make any sense. So I'm starting to feel a little sorry for her at this point, so I'm gonna let her in on the secret, and I say, it doesn't need to make sense, it just needs to work. And that's really the way this system goes. Thanks, Great. Roger. Thanks very much, Katie. <laughs> okay, so that may not be your definition of smart, but it is learning. And so this is what we call machine learning. Machine learning is a technique that allows computers to learn like your brain does. But what does that mean? Let's talk about your brain for a minute. So your brain is full of these things called neurons. Your neurons have a cell body, and it's receiving uh, electrical signals from other neurons that are connected to it through its dendrites. So as those signals come in, the, the, oh, the electrical charge of the cell body increases, and when it reaches what's called a threshold, then it spikes. And that means that it sends a signal down the axon. It then connects through its axon terminals to other neurons through their dendrites, and the cycle continues. So this all seems very simple until you realize that you have nearly 100 billion of these in the average human brain. And they're connected through complex connections that can get stronger or weaker or form new pathways over time. And that's what we call learning. And that's how your brain is able to control everything that happens in your body, from your heart beating, to you shifting in your seat right now, to you deciding to come to this presentation today. But now we're gonna switch to computers and see how we can integrate this all together. So how many people are familiar with traditional if-then coding? So yes, great, okay, good. So I like to think of um, if-then coding as choose your own adventure. Um, so you follow these strict rules where you say, if this happens, then that happens. And so it follows a single path, and you can, you can relate that to a lot of choose your own adventure books, like if you want to fight the dragon, then turn to page 97. So the way that I always read these books was I read all of the possible outcomes, and then I decided which was the best outcome so that I could go to that. So I didn't really follow all the rules, but I got to the outcome that I wanted. And so this is important when we're talking about artificial neural networks. So artificial neural networks are like those neurons and the connections that they have in your brain, but these are artificial ones through computers. Um, and so they allow us to solve way problems in different ways. And so, for example, when you were getting ready today, did you say, if I choose this shirt, then I wear these pants? Probably not. You know, you probably were not that strict on the rules. You probably hadn't gone through your wardrobe and decided all of the rules that you must have. Um, so you probably just chose a shirt and then got a pair of pants and said, yeah, this will work. Um, and then if you were brushing your teeth and you, you know, got toothpaste on your shirt, would you have to get rid of that shirt, and start over again, and then choose a new, new shirt and then a new pair of pants? 
So you probably didn't. You probably were able to just pick a new shirt that was clean that went with the pants you were already wearing. And so these are two important concepts with artificial neural networks. They allow you to look at lots of different paths simultaneously, and they also adapt to changes. And so we're going to take this to a coding example, and we're going to solve it two different ways. And so the, the challenge for this is if we have a very simple language and we have two words in a three-word sentence, can we guess the third word in the sentence? And so we're going to define this language as having four nouns. Two of them are subjects, two of them are objects, and then we have two verbs. So our nouns are I and she, and then the objects are me and her. And our two verbs are no and knows. Okay, so because of this, we could figure out all of the possible sentences, and we have eight of them. And so we look at these sentences, and I know me isn't really grammatically correct, so we get rid of that one. I know her is fine. I knows me, that's not grammatically correct. We cross that one out. I knows her, again, it's not grammatically correct. She know me, that doesn't work. She know her is not grammatically correct. So she knows me and she knows her are fine. So now we're left with three possible sentences and that's because we know English and we know the rules of grammar. So we're able to narrow it down to those. And so we're, we're left with I know her, she knows me and she knows her. Now we'll look at those sentences and we'll write some if then logic. And so we'll say if I is one of the used words then we know that the sentence must be, I know her. Or, and it's because we've already gone through all of the possible sentences, and that's the only one that has I in it. So then if the other word is no, then you can say that you know that the missing word is her. Otherwise, it's I blank her, and so the blank must be no. So we could give that as the answer. If I wasn't in the sentence, and now she is one of the words in the sentence, sentence, then we know that it must be she knows me or she knows her because we already looked at the sentences and those are the only possibilities. So now if knows is one of the words, then the other, the missing word must be me or her. We don't know which one, so we just give both of those as the answer. And otherwise, then it's she blank me or she blank her, and we don't know which one, but the missing word must be her. Or, sorry, it must be knows. And this example would go on. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't solved all of the possible solutions. We haven't come up with all of the possible solutions here, so it would go on. But now we're gonna look at the neural network kind of solution. And so what we have here, remember, is we have the neurons and we have the connections between the neurons. So we're going to have the words and we're going to see what connections we have between these words. So you see that We've put all the words on the top and the bottom. And now I connects to no and her because it could be in the same sentence with no and her. She connects to knows, me, and her. No connects to I and her. Knows connects to she, me, and her. Me connects to she and knows. And her connects to I, she, no, and knows. So now if we have an example where the two words that we are given are no and her, we can look at those connections and just those connections. So no connects to I and her, and we're gonna give those a weight of one. Her connects to I, she, no, and knows, because those are in the same sentences. But there are more of those, so they don't have as big of a weight, and we'll talk about that more later. Um, but now we'll look at the sums. And so this is like those neurons where they're getting electrical charges from all the other neurons that are connected to them. So now they're feeding in and that, that charge is getting stronger. So in this case, I has the highest weight. It has the highest sum of one and a half and the others are lower. And so we're going to say that is our most likely answer. And that's because we have two connections coming into it, we have no coming into it, and we have her coming into it. And so from that, we believe that our answer is I know her. So now, what if we took those two solutions and then we added two more words to our language? We add he and him. 
So with the traditional if then solution, we have to go back to our sentences that we had. So we had eight sentences before, and we were able to cross out five of them, but now we have 18 sentences. And so it got a lot bigger quickly by adding two words. We could cross out a lot of these words based on um, the grammar that we understand, but we still have eight sentences, and so then we'd have to start again with our if-then coding and go through all of the examples. But if we took our neural network solution, it's a little bit different. So we'd start with our same neural network, and then we add the two new words. Him now connects to I, she, no, knows, and he, and he connects to him, knows, me, and her. So this is what I was talking about, how neural networks can adapt to changes. You could take the network that you already had, now you could add something new and set those weights. But the question is, how do we get those weights? And so this is another thing that we'll have Roger and, and one of his students, Max, come out here to talk about. This is a basketball example. <coughs> So um, I asked my student, Max, to, to join us here. And uh, I said, hey, Max, can you dribble a basketball? So go ahead. Can you do that a little faster, please? And maybe one time more. OK, fantastic. So Max, um, now that you've shown us that you can dribble a basketball, would you mind, here, let me get you a pen. And could you just go over to the easel over there and write the uh, equations that you need to uh, describe the physics that let you bat dribble the basketball? I don't think I can do that. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so then the question is, Max, how did you learn to do that if you don't know the equations? What did you do? I just played basketball as a kid, and I practiced. So practice allowed you to be able to dribble the basketball, not understanding all the physics behind it. Is that, is that the case? I think so, yeah. OK, so it's like the, the neural network is learning. It's the same way that we learn to do something. Thanks very much, Katie. Great, thanks, guys. So now if we come back to this example, we can talk about that. So you know, where did we get these weights from? Well, it's practice. And so the example here is um, you know, like the basketball, when you do something, you, you practice, those, those weights can get stronger, they can get bigger if you're doing something good. If something doesn't work out, then they can get weaker. So what you can see with this example is that the words, the connections between the words get stronger with usage. And so if you're looking at a lot of text, maybe through books, maybe through um, you know, whatever access you have, maybe just people speaking, then you can see how those connections are getting stronger. The more often the words are together in the same sentence, the stronger those weights get. And that's very much like how the brain works. And that's different than computer models in the way that we were talking about that, where we needed to know the equations. We often don't need to know the equations of how something works. We know it from experience. We've tried something and we've learned what works and what doesn't. And this is where the internet comes in. It gives us lots of information. And so a company like Google is getting information when you start to type something in the search bar. It will give you ways to complete whatever you're typing in. And if you choose one of those, then you're making that signal stronger. You're telling it that that's a good answer. If you choose something else, if you write in something else that it didn't give you, not only are you telling it that um, that, you're not, that you don't want to increase the weights there, you're also giving it other possible solutions. And it's not just you, it's a lot of people. And they're doing it a lot of times during the day. And so there's so much information that these, these techniques with machine learning, they're able to get better and better all the time because they're getting that information. And because of this, machine learning is so common that hardware is evolving too. So here's an example of hardware that is made to solve these types of problems. And so this is IBM's True North chip. 
And what it does is it takes the concepts of your brain, the neurons and the neural connections, and it puts them into hardware. And so this 16-chip board that we have at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory that I've been running on um, has 16 million neurons and it has four billion neural connections between them. Remember, the average human brain has more like 100 billion neuron connect, neural connections, so it's, it's smaller than that, but this is still a really big number. And those neural networks that we looked at, we, we saw a very simple one, but they can get a lot more complicated than that. They can have a lot more layers, and they can have um, positive connections, they can have negative connections, and that's what this type of hardware allows you to do. And one of the positives about this is that it also uses very little power. Your brain uses very little power. And so that, that is something that's translating into this. Um, one of the things we saw in the video is, uh, was about the amount of power that's used for our supercomputers. And this is a way to look at other options. But what kinds of things can you do with this type of computer? So here's an example of um, of solving problems to identify images using this chip. Safer 10 image classifier is ready on True North. I still think it's the cutest thing that it says kitty. Um, so, so an important thing that you can see right up here on this screen is that it tells us it's 75% sure that it's a truck. It's also 39% sure that it's a car and 11% sure that it's a kitty. <laughs> so it's not giving you an exact answer. Um, and a lot of times, you know, that's how your brain works is you're not getting an exact answer. You can guess. You can guess based on experience that you had, but it might be wrong. Now we're gonna go back to this idea of it using very little power. So um, if, you, if you think about the amount of power that's necessary for supercomputers, Sierra is projected to use 10 megawatts of power. So one megawatt of power is approximately enough for a community of about 40,000 people. So Livermore uses about two megawatts of power. When we're talking about 10 megawatts of power, that's more like the city of Oakland, 400,000 people. So that's a huge amount of power. If we think about what, what kinds of computers we need in the future to get the resolution that we need to solve our problems even more accurately, we're looking at uh, a, lot, a lot more power than that. So we need to think about other options. True North uses about uh, one ten thousandth of the amount of power to solve a similar problem. So instead of the city of Oakland, we're more talking about 40 people. So that's more like a single street. And so if we think about the power that we're going to need in the future to solve our problems with higher resolution, we're looking at 40 to 50 megawatts. Um, and that's if we don't start using computers, computer hardware that uses less energy. And so now we've gone from the city of Oakland to all of Alameda County, two million people. That includes both Livermore and Oakland and a lot in between. So what kinds of changes can we make? So we still need to use hardware that solves problems exactly. If we're asking what is four plus flat five, we need to get the answer nine. We can't say we're 11% sure that the answer is one. 
We need to get answers to those types of problems, and we have a lot of equations. We do understand a lot of physics. We understand a lot of what goes into our computer models, and those problems need to be solved correctly. But we can look at problems that can be put onto this other type of hardware, something that doesn't have to be solved exactly. We don't necessarily have the right answer to it, and we don't need a perfect solution. And if we can put some of our, of our problems onto this type of hardware, we can save a lot of energy. So if we take maybe 20 to 25% of our problems and move it to this type of hardware, then we could save enough to power the city of Oakland. Well, what types of things can we put on that? kind of computer. So let's talk about resolution again. Remember when we had the butterfly example, we were able to increase the resolution to see what the image was. But we just increased the, the resolution everywhere. And maybe that's not necessary. And if we have an algorithm that learns how to increase the resolution just where we care about the resolution, then that might get us a better answer. And so for this, we might just look at this, this area here, and if we had a machine learning um, algorithm to tell us where to look, then we could just increase the resolution in one spot. So we'll increase it there and continue to increase it where we've learned we need more resolution. So you see that the image becomes clearer, and then we can see that it's an eagle. It's not a perfect eagle. Some of it's cut off. Um, and if you look at what the image is supposed to look like, the, the clear image um, with all of the pixels in, increased, then you'll see a lot more detail in the clouds, in the mountains, in the trees. But you've used a lot more resolution to get there. In this, in this example, the image on the left uses about a third of the number of pixels as the image on the right. And although it's not a perfect, perfect image, it is a very good image where the eagle is. And if that's what we care about, then that's really the most important thing. And if we're only using a third of the pixels, then we have a lot more that we could put into solving other problems. So you could ask yourself, you could ask your Amazon Echo, if you have one. Uh, you could say, Alexa, is modeling as exciting as talking robots? And you know, going back to the whole, are they smarter? Her answer to this, by the way, is, sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. But I do know the answer. I'm saying yes. So we get to work on really great and really important problems. We work on modeling the Earth's climate. We work on better understanding and fighting cancer. And we work on better understanding our universe. So to me, this is really exciting work, really important work. And I'm, I'm glad that I get to work on this. So thank you, everyone, for coming today. Roger's going to come out, and we'll have some time to answer some questions, if you have any.